I'm Keith and I do Dev Success at Expo. So I wanted to talk today about the evolution towards providing access to more native UI and capabilities uh, in, uh, in, in React Native ecosystem and Expo's role in that. I wasn't really sure what to call this. Uh, for a long time, the working title was like, here's some cool new stuff in SDK 53, I guess. But what it means for us is that in React Native, we can build the best native applications, period. And we can build them quickly. But I think I'm preaching to the choir here. At the same time, even if you've agreed with this last year or the year before that, um, every year, uh, all the time, it's felt more and more true in different ways. Just as we've like, been at AppJS and seen the more cool new native things that we can do uh, on stage every year. Um, I guess what feels special about right now is that it's not just that we can build the best native experiences in React Native, but increasingly we will. What used to seem niche and specialized will become the default for more people. If you've typically steered clear of native code and capabilities in the past, I think you'll, you'll be thinking more about it this year. Um, not with like dread or trepidation, but like anticipation. You'll be looking forward to it. Um, and not just for us here at AppJS, but in the future, new developers to React Native and non-developers will kind of just fall into it by accident when they're building the next generation of apps with AI. Uh, so more new native code, cool stuff to make the best apps fast for everyone all the time. But first, I would like to discuss pits, craters, chasms, depressions, holes. I'll start close to home with a large sinkhole that appeared on one of the busiest intersections of my town. It was caused by a water main break, which made a little underground river that ate away the soil and the stone underneath until there was nothing left for the asphalt to sit on. Motorins, motorists, pedestrians, city planners, they hate this. But developers actually kind of like this? I don't mean that we call out to the earth to please swallow me whole while Gradle is sinking. I just can't take it any longer. No, there's just one hole we want to fall into, the pit of success. It's really nice to just focus on the features that make your app special and feel confident that the tools you're using will just kind of default you into all those other things that are important without trials and tribulations and wailing and gnashing of teeth like good performance or a clean, professional, intuitive user interface. The pit of success should be like your typical sinkhole from my home in the United States Midwest, big and deep and appearing suddenly right in the middle of the most traveled thoroughfare. If it can't swallow an 18-wheeler hole, we're just not interested. It's actually the more surprising, it's the better, at least for development. Uh, it's just a great feeling when you're working on your app and you're just working, working, and suddenly what appears on the screen is like exactly what you wanted. Um, it was, you couldn't believe it was done already, and it wasn't nearly as hard as you thought it would be. I think vibe coding shines a bright light on this where the pits of success are and aren't, challenging assumptions about what's easy and hard. Non-developers now have access to bots with all the world's documentation and public code samples uh, and all that stuff, but the jury's out on their aesthetics. Uh, given a normal set of prompts like make this or that feature, how does the tooling help the AI code something that's not just passively functional, but with a great native look and feel? Experienced developers know a bunch of little things to get the most out of their tools and find the pits of success more often than the new dev. We can't just forget all that, but vibe coding forces you to verbalize all those little things, or the else the AI just might not do them. Saying this stuff out loud can be a little uncomfortable, and it becomes more obvious why these things don't just happen in every app all the time. To this end, I recently tried to sit in that discomfort, pretending to be a new developer, hoping to vibe code my way into the pit of success. I threw my requirements down the well and watched eagerly to see them rise from the chasm as a good looking and feeling native mobile front end, embracing the default look and feel of the platform. Okay, so let's play new developer. I don't wanna make any assumptions. I wanna momentarily forget everything I know. It's not, it's not that much, so it won't be that hard. So uh, no React Native, never heard of it. How did I get started mobile? Well, I had an iPhone at the time, and I was like, damn it, I want to put an app on my phone. So I'll get, I'll, I just assumed that you had to use Apple's tools. So OK, I'll go right there. I'll open up a new project in Xcode, boot up cursor alongside, and ask it to start building this little fitness app UI. There were things that like, were kind of tricky, like data binding from like a, a bottom sheet to the main screen. Like Cursor was not happy. I had to go Google it, and uh, it took a while. But like, I think I pretty much like three prompted the entire UI. I was just like, I want these fields with those controls, and it picked them straight from the standard Swift UI toolkit. 
Like, you want a list with drag and, door, drag and drop sorting and cool delete animations? That's just the list. Uh, there's not a lot of fine tuning or pixel perfect positioning here. The level of detail was like, make this button big and blue. So I'd rate this pit of success as very capable of swallowing a car whole. Much like the sinkhole that swallowed eight whole Chevrolet Corvettes in a house in a museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 2014, this region of the United States is notable for its karst topography, where subterranean limestone is gradually eroded by ground, running groundwater. It's kind of like nature's water main break. This geological phenomenon can bring occasional destruction, but just as often great beauty, and is also responsible for the breathtaking caverns in nearby Mammoth Cave National Park. OK, back to coding. I'm not exactly sure when I first thought about cross-platform development. I think it was about the time where I dropped my iPhone into a lake and had to switch to Android. Uh, but eventually, my, my new developer persona wants their app to run on everyone's phones. React Native means I can do that in one code base with real native UI components. I wave my AI wand, and it works. I'm pretty happy with this. Shipping fast on two platforms with one code base is just good for the soul. Uh, but I, I did, there were tricky parts. I burned a lot of prompts trying to get vaguely in the neighborhood of the look and feel of V1 on the iPhone. Uh, I'm okay with a little more styling, but I couldn't take for granted anymore that the list will have the same swipe or edit or drag and sort behaviors. I was kind of like on my own for that. Um, at the same time, a lot of the other like, developer experience was great. It's just very intuitive to do a lot of things in React. So React Native certainly has this native UX pit of success, as it can technically do anything that we, can, we did in the first example. But it can sometimes be hard to find. Much like the famous blue hole just off of Lake Erie's Sandusky Bay, formed and fed by an underground stream, it's clear as your water is a consistent 9 degrees Celsius year-round, and it doesn't rise or fall with floods or droughts. It's like magic. It's just down the road from the world's tallest roller coaster, so you think that a lot of people would see it. And perhaps even a few would fall in. Alas, your best view of this sinkhole is probably from this old-timey postcard. It's been private property of the exclusive Castalia Trout Fishing Club for the last 30 years. What we need is the Swift UI pit of success combined with the rest of the React Native developer experience. So has anybody tried Expo UI yet? Awesome, awesome. Is anybody going to just like, stop paying attention, open up their laptop, and try it right now? It's OK. I won't judge. Uh, to reliably make it possible for anyone to make a UI like you would get out of the box in Xcode, we need not just the building blocks we've always had, always had in React Native Core. We need the higher order primitives that you regularly interact with when building a Swift UI interface. Expo UI aims to provide the direct access to these right in your JSX. This is not a UI library. This is simply access to a standard platform design language right alongside the rest of your cross-platform React Native code. Now we can build a UI just like we built for iOS only, but right in a platform-specific file. We get a component layout whose defaults look good. Very little styling is needed. We get sophisticated default behaviors out of the box. We can save our animations for doing other cool stuff besides trying to approximate what a Swift UI list might do. And I can do this right in React syntax, my happy place. It's long been possible to build native modules encapsulating these components, and many, have already, and many libraries have already incorporated them. But with Expo UI, in a single package, you get a one-to-one -one mapping to all those higher order native components you might need. A Swift UI developer could pick things right up without missing a beat for the most part. So what sinkhole shall I compare this to? I'll go with Lake Yola. In 1873, who you might call the original Florida man, Jacob Summerlin, purchased 200 acres for cattle ranching in the center of the state. There was an un otherwise unremarkable sinkhole at the edge of the property, but it connected to an underground aquifer, and then because, you know, it's like Florida and it storms all the time, it flooded and it became this beautiful lake. The land was then donated to the city of Orlando, and now you can't miss it on your way to Disney World. Moving beyond my hastily made workup app, uh, the Vancouver Hot Chocolate Festival app by Andrew Karn recently caught our eye as a relatively simple yet non-trivial use of the standard platform UI that would make a good test case to rebuild an Expo UI. Uh, so Kudo Chien did it. And it, all the controls there, there are even some that, you know, that we've had before, like Expo Maps. Um, it's pretty cool. I recommend you check it out. You can check it out with the, the PR with that link, or you could just go to the Expo GitHub and just search Hot Cocoa. There's not that many PRs that involve Hot Cocoa in the Expo repo. A wide variety of Swift UI controls are represented already, including date picker, color picker, segmented controls, list, bottom sheets, switch, switch text input, and more. 
We're also starting to fill these in for Jetpack Compose, so developers can do the same thing for Android. You can use certain components individually and alongside the rest of your React Native code. Or you can use the same controls and more structural components like H and V stacks to compose entire Swift UI interfaces inside of a host control via the Swift UI primitives export. The library is expanding all, all the time, in part because it's not often that complicated to bring on new controls individually with the Expo modules API. Expose some props, map those external props to their Jetpack Compose or Swift UI equivalents, and you're off to the races. Expo UI is experimental in SDK 53. We encourage folks to give it a try and report any issues they find in this early phase. While the basic idea of using Jetpack Compose and Swift UI controls in React Native sounds intuitive, and it's pretty straightforward to wrap individual controls, there's a lot to it under the hood. We expect changes to the API as we determine the best ways to interact with these higher order controls, uh, which have not been used much in the React Native ecosystem. So really look forward to you trying it out and giving us your input. Uh, a lot of that complication comes not just in how you use these components individually, but in nesting them, treating Jetpack Compose and Swift UI components as arbitrary children inside of React Native views, and vice versa. You could say that, we're crossing the streams. And that carries some risk and needs some work. But I can't think of a better group to harness the great power of Jetpack Compose and Swift UI and React Native than the folks we have working on it right now. Besides the Expo and Software Mansion folks working on the Expo SDK, the effort to bring modern UI components in the React Native is a community effort, particularly with foundations in Andrew Levy's Swift UI React Native library and Tomas Cepeda's work to bring Swift UI and Jetpack Compose to the Expo modules API. Using Expo UI isn't for every app or every screen in every app, but I think we're on the cusp of a new era where the calculus of when and where and how often to break out in the platform-specific code is going to change significantly for more developers. Previously, breaking out into a single platform-specific file was pretty rare for me, and I don't think I'm in the minority. Uh, so, so to, to, with the emergent capability to break out into these native platform design languages, just like I'm writing any other React Native screen, has me thinking that I will start doing this in more of my apps in the future. Tomorrow, maintaining separate screens for Android, iOS, and web might be just as efficient for developers as it would be to have a single view that was served for all of them. And then within each of those files, the flexibility is unprecedented. It's kind of like, wait, what is that? Okay. This is a bit of a strained analogy, but let me introduce you to a different type of pit of success, of the culinary variety. So there's this restaurant near me. The only thing they sell is hot dogs and tater tots. Uh, and they give you this note card, and there's like 86 different toppings on it. And you get a little golf pencil, and you can check any one you want. You can put like fried egg, kimchi, breakfast cereal, peanut butter, mac and cheese, you name it. And no matter what you put, what you check on there, when it comes back from the kitchen, it will taste amazing. I have tried so many times to sabotage my hot dog, and I have failed every time. Um, so I think that's kind of where this is going, is you can have like, you know, Swift UI and Jetpack Compose views uh, via Expo UI. You can have those alongside your standard React Native views. You can have those alongside uh, web components via Expo DOM components. Uh, you can put them inside of each other. Um, and like, you just do the things that are intuitive and, and lay them out as you expect it to, and it works. Um, and even if, if, you, if not all of that is enough for you, you could even break out using the Expo Modules API and write Swift and Kotlin directly and, and use those Swift UI and Jetpack Compose views like right inside native code. And so I think that's what it'll look like. <laughs> uh, so speaking of the Expo Modules API, this low boilerplate, uh, powerful toolkit for interfacing with native code has contributed to a blossoming of new and improved native modules in the Expo SDK and all over the community. A better framework for native modules makes it faster to ship new modules and improve them. Uh, for instance, shared objects in the Expo modules API means that we can keep references to native object state in your JavaScript, reducing round trips to disk, a real world performance benefit that users can actually feel in apps with long lists of images or videos. Like, there's no penalty for using native code, or your own custom native code. In, in recent SDKs, we've released several new Expo modules API-based packages and rewritten others, including image, audio, video, maps, SQLite, and file system. Besides all the cool stuff it brings to the Expo SDK, 
One of my favorite things about the modules API is it also is very accessible to just drop some native code directly into your project if you need to write a little bit. Uh, you can run this uh, NPX create expo module with the local flag, and it adds a folder right in the root of your project where you can just throw in some extra Kotlin and Swift code. No need to organize them in a separate package or mono repo. Whatever code you drop in your local modules folder just gets linked automatically when pre-build is run. But back to the Expo SDK, one welcome addition in SDK 53 is the Expo background task library, built around the new Android Work Manager and iOS BG Task Scheduler APIs. It's a new clean interface that should make it straightforward to set up and maintain periodic background tasks, as it would be as if you were implementing in them in the native IDE. Probably even easier, it's been a while since I've tried to do anything like this in Xcode, but I'm guessing it would involve me making several trips to this website. You could use it for refreshing data in the background. This could be a particularly potent combination with the increasing number of local first solutions that are compatible with Expo via Expo SQLite. Sync with the server in the background, and the user can work unencumbered with the latest data later, even if they're offline and haven't opened the app in a while. And then when they're back online, their updates will sync back to the server without them having to do anything else. It's also compatible with the Expo Updates API. You can now update your app's JavaScript over the air with EAS update, and users can receive and apply the, that update before they even open the app. Widening the pit of success in React Native isn't just about making modern native UI components more accessible, but it's about putting all capabilities built into the mobile operating systems at your fingertips, so you'll want to use them all the time. I tend to avoid background tasks in the past. They just seem kind of you know, hard to work around, opaque. My, in, my users tolerated loading everything when the app started. At least they didn't complain to me, or I didn't listen to them. Uh, I don't think I was the only one. <laughs> but apps that already have their latest code and data loaded when you open them like really smart. The best apps, the apps that are the most trusted and indispensable parts of your users' daily lives, uh, they're working when they're not. They're always ready when you are. I forgot to mention that Expo UI has some nice native spinners and progress bars, but you might not need them much in this new native pit of success. Tools that inside and out reliably lead developers towards defaults that look and feel great. To what crevasse in the terra firma shall I compare these two? I'm going to go with the largest sinkhole in the world at over 600 meters across and deep, the Zhaojai Heavenly Pit a pit that's so successful that it's home to about 1,300 animal species, including the rare clouded leopard and Chinese giant salamander, a pit that you couldn't miss and you might not want to leave once you fall in. In conclusion, Expo is excavating. The whole React Native ecosystem is digging deep. We're moving earth by the truckload and opening up wider pits of success for us all to fall into. Whether you're checking out Expo UI, the new Expo background task, building your own Expo module, or using any one of the amazing community packages that bring enhanced native functionality to React Native, more so than ever, React Native is the best place to be building beautiful, performant, smart, capable apps fast. Thank you very much. <laughs>